The Midwest and the South are known for a lot of things, which may be subjective to you. But I think we can all agree that food, football, and depression-era gangsters all have a historic and notorious place in those two regions. See, during the Depression era, the South and Midwest became a smorgasbord of bank robbers and outlaws. You could literally play a game of human checkers the way those guys were bouncing around, pouncing on trains, and sticking up banks. That infamous era of gangsters has influenced pop culture for decades. And I'm sure there are far-reaching things I can't imagine that I haven't discovered that are also tied to the lore of guys like John Dillinger, Babyface Nelson, and today's subject, Pretty Boy Floyd. Which takes us to Georgia, 1904, where Charles Arthur Floyd was born. Charles didn't stay long as his family of farmers relocated to Oklahoma during the younger years of his childhood. Floyd seemed to have a fascination with outlaw behavior growing up because by the time he was 18, it festered. He robbed a post office, and that was the beginning of a criminal chapter in his life. Luckily for him, he was able to evade the charges, and soon after that, he met and married Ruby Hardgraves, with whom he got pregnant. However, at 21 years old, he was facing his first prison sentence for the robbery of a post office in St. Louis in which he originally got away with $16,000 before being caught. Unfortunately for Floyd, while he was in prison, his wife had his child, she then divorced him too and his dad was killed. Floyd went through a pretty rough stretch both in prison and in his personal life simultaneously. After serving his time for the robbery in St. Louis, Charles Pretty Boy Floyd moved across the state to Kansas City. That's where the party really started once Floyd arrived, because that's where he eventually met his outlaw associates and started making a name for himself. There are several rumors as to how, where, and why Pretty Boy Floyd received his nickname, ranging from co-workers on a rig to a bank teller he robbed, and there was also the story that he got the name from a woman he was sharing relations with. But no matter where he got the nickname, it's said that he eventually despised it, and I mean just hated it. It's thought that one of Floyd's first kills was that of a guy whom he believed took his father's life. The guy was never found guilty of the crime. He was charged and then acquitted, which obviously didn't please pretty boy Floyd. It didn't take long for Floyd to take on work as muscle for bootleggers. He was known to be dangerous and efficient like me with a spoon and pint of ice cream. See, I always eat the whole thing, even when I plan not to. And that may not be a good analogy to you, but it makes sense to me because I will kill a whole pint of ice cream in minutes without a single bit of remorse. Now, around 1928 to 1929, he began robbing banks. He quickly became notorious for his role as a strong arm robber. Rather it was myth or fact, it's alleged that Charles Pretty Boy Floyd would tear up mortgage papers in order to remove people from the grips of whatever bank their property was under. In 1929, he had several close calls with law enforcement in Missouri and Colorado, but he was fortunate to get off without any serious charges as these weren't his usual violent crimes. Floyd would often go by the alias of Frank Mitchell. He would later be arrested for the robbery of a bank in Akron, Ohio in 1930. On his way to prison, he broke through a train window and evaded immediate capture. Then he immediately went back to robbing banks with his fellow outlaws like Frank Nash and Adam Rochetti. In 1931, Floyd was involved in the death of a police officer named Ralph Kastner in Bowling Green, Ohio, during a robbery. One of Floyd's associates, a man named William Miller, was killed during the gunfire exchange along with Officer Kastner. After that, Floyd killed federal agent Curtis Burke during a confrontation in Missouri. Floyd had become notorious for his violence towards law enforcement. They were well aware that he was packing automatic weapons and he was eager to shoot at anything with a badge. But because of that, things were heating up for Floyd. The walls were closing in and his name was now being connected to almost every violent crime and shooting from the South to the Midwest. Well, at least if you ask the police and the FBI. Floyd was also suspected in the death of the Ash Brothers, who were bootleggers from the Midwest. Later on in 1932, he shot a sheriff named Irv Kelly, who attempted to arrest Pretty Boy Floyd. Things changed dramatically in 1933, though, when allegedly Floyd, 
Vernon Miller and Adam Machete attempted to break out their now incarcerated friend, Frank Jelly Nash, out of police custody during a transport to Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas. Now, for context, historians can't agree on who wasn't and who was there during what is now known as the Kansas City Massacre. But on June 7th, Floyd and his associates opened fire on the guards transporting Frank Nash. Ironically, Frank Nash was killed during the shootout along with four law enforcement officers including Special Agent Ray Caffrey, Detectives William Grooms and Frank Hermanson, along with Police Chief Otto Reed. In total, five men were killed, resulting in a violent day that ultimately led to Pretty Boy Floyd becoming public enemy number one after John Dillinger's demise. Floyd denied being involved in the massacre and even sent a letter to police denying his involvement. In 1934, after evading police for a while in the Midwest, Floyd was spotted in East Liverpool, Ohio, where a pursuit ensued into a cornfield. And allegedly from there, famed G-man Melvin Purvis shot and killed pretty boy Floyd. But wait, there's more. Because later on, another lawman named Chester Smith declared in 1979 that he was in fact the one who wounded Floyd with two subduing shots from a Winchester rifle because he was afraid Purvis couldn't get clean shots. Upon approaching Floyd, Smith alleges that Purvis ordered an agent named Herman Hollis to execute Pretty Boy after questioning him and claims his death was covered up by the FBI. Things didn't stop there though, as FBI agent Winfred E. Hopton claimed that Chester Smith was lying and that Hollis wasn't present the day that Pretty Boy Floyd was shot and killed. Either way, Floyd lived and died by the gun. He clearly had no regrets or reservations about the life he chose. It's estimated that he was responsible for the deaths of at least 10 men and over a dozen bank robberies, cementing himself into criminal infamy during one of America's most polarizing eras. Floyd had decided he was going to take back what he believed the government institutions and banks had taken from him and so many like him. He was known as the Robin Hood of Cooks and Hills in Oklahoma. That was a place he frequented to hide out and the locals would protect him because he was gracious, supposedly. Charles Arthur Pretty Boy Floyd is as much a part of American history as the Great Depression was itself. I apologize for any inaccuracies, but outlaw history from this time period was incredibly hard to solidify from a fact standpoint. I referenced as much as I could, but some of the things about Floyd were never proven and I do want to acknowledge that. However, I did my absolute best to string together what I could. I hope you enjoyed this story. Thanks for stopping by. Put a hit on the like button, subscribe, and have a wonderful rest of your day.